Namaskar. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. Today I have with me Major Madhav Kumar again, and we are going to talk about a very interesting hush hush visit that took place in the last couple of weeks. I don't know exactly the date. To get all the details and the significance of this visit and what happened after that, let us welcome Major Madhav Kumar. Major Madhav Kumar, Namaskaram. Welcome to P Guru's channel. Namaskaram, sir. Namaskaram. Jai Hind. Jai Hind and uh, Bharat Mata ki Jai. Major Madan Kumar, Nicholas Burns, the uh, <laughs> director of CIA, comes on a hush hush trip to Sri Lanka. Did the Indian government know about it before or after the fact? And what really happened? What was the purpose, sir? Yes, it's a very interesting up update. Uh, William Burns, uh, Mr. William Burns. Uh, Not Nicholas, you're right. William Burns. Yeah. William Burns. Sorry about that. Bill Burns. Yeah. So he landed up in Sri Lanka on 14th of Feb uh, last month. And he uh, had spent around uh, 18 hours in Sri Lanka. It was a very classified and a confidential uh, visit. Uh, it should have been known to the Indian intelligence agencies and uh, a very closed and a very uh, well kept secret uh, as far as Sri Lanka is concerned. But later on, it was officially acknowledged uh, by Sri Lankan uh, newspapers, by their opposition leaders, and government kind of kept quiet. And uh, there is absolutely no uh, sort of revert or an acknowledgement as far as US is concerned. But what one thing got confirmed uh, for sure is that from Sri Lanka, from Colombo, he was supposed to fly to uh, Kathmandu, Nepal. Uh, he had sought a permission for a landing and uh, spent some around 15 hours of time in Nepal. But that was refused by the Nepalese government. When this refusal is... happened, yeah. yeah. Yeah, one wonders who stopped them. Please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it seems uh, there was a Chinese uh, envoy who was also present at the same time in uh, Nepal, and the government has uh, refused for uh, this particular uh, uh, visit of uh, Mr. William Burns. So, uh, interesting thing is later, uh, a week after, on 17th of Feb, uh, I think 17th or 18th of Feb. There were two uh, uh, globe masters, uh, C-17 globe masters, which uh, took off from a military U.S. military base at Greece. They landed up in Sri Lanka one after the other. Uh, that was actually headed by the U.S. Uh, principal uh, deputy secretary for uh, Asia Pacific, Jadidya or Royal. So this gentleman, along with a panel of 29 U.S. Uh, there are officials, there are uh, uh, members from CAA, the members from US Defense. So, a very, very important uh, set of delegates. Uh, they also visited Sri Lanka. Uh, they landed in Katanayake Airport, and these two Globe Masters were just never seen in Sri Lanka in the past so many years. They, they never seen such a huge aircraft landing up in their airport. This visit was also kept completely uh, in blank. The people were not told. A lot of media, local media in Sri Lanka raised queries on who they are and uh, why they have visited here and so on. So they had again spent a day and uh, the next day they left. Uh, surprisingly, there was no records of immigration checks. There was no records of their arrival. There were no records of the departure. But obviously, such a huge aircraft uh, landing in Sri Lanka, uh, they were uh, the, the local media was aware. And the JVP was the first party, uh, the opposition party, to raise up this issue. Uh, and they were started pressurizing the Ranil's government to declassify why they visited, what was discussed, and so on and so. But uh, absolutely, there was no uh, disclosure from the Sri Lankan government. So uh, once that was done, so the ex bureaucrats who were involved in Sri Lanka U.S. relationship, they had uh, spoken about few uh, salient points uh, as far as what was discussed in that meeting of. Uh, Jadidia or Royal. Uh, one is setting up an intelligence analysis center, uh, a US intelligence analysis center in USA. And uh, they also want to donate a biometric immigration control system. Now, this is the donation. Obviously, they need to, they want to collect the data of who's coming into Sri Lanka and who's going out. And third was to grant access for submarine uh, telecommunication cables and data passing through Sri Lankan waters. 
and uh, so these are the three major aspects uh, which was discussed between the sri lankan government uh, and the us delegates came and went back this was pretty much known to india because uh, the air traffic permissions are all uh, required uh, and they were in touch with uh, india but indian foreign ministry and as well as indian government is uh, till date they have not officially reacted to, to this particular visit but what we can understand is that uh us direct intervention uh in sri lankan affairs and uh, cs top boss uh, plus uh, somebody like a defense secretary uh, he, he may be a, a junior level defense secretary but still he holds a lot of uh, power in asia pacific when they all land up in sri lanka it raises a lot of questions for india as well and uh, china too is actually closely watching this uh, particular visit the back to back visit which happened one on 14th of feb and subsequently on 17th and 18th of feb uh, thank you major madan uh, i have to share some interesting news that's coming out of the united states and this is uh, you know something that is fairly known now you see about 80% of all the cranes that lift cargo from ships onto the land any port any sea port of united states these are made or built in china turns out now people are finding out that that also transmits data back to motherland so anything that is landing anywhere is again known to china now this begs the larger question can china completely disrupt the supply lines by choking up this point because remember they threatened india and then they carried out the threat by taking mumbai's portions of the electricity grid for 13 hours in 2020 20 or 21 i don't remember exactly now they said they do it and they did it just to prove to india that we are look we can do this to you i think india has since then you know fixed this problem but what this particular trip indicates in my opinion major madan and i'll ask you for yours is that us is really preparing for a war of some sorts with china this is not something that is so simple now Uh, china has tried a lot of things they probably have a few years of head start remember the chinese ambassador wearing angavastram and going to hindu temples and then looking beyond at the, the kachativ area and saying that okay all this is mine like i can mine for thorium and all that stuff so deliberately done with uh, full photographers in attendance uh, major madan what do you see uh, happening now so uh, two three things uh, we can break it down uh, so uh, apart from this uh, intelligence analysis center it's clearly uh, clearly clearly indicates that us want to establish a base there but the broader picture is uh, there are three agreements which us has been uh, you know forcing sri lanka or negotiating with sri lanka one is uh, called the sofa security of forces agreement that us has got that uh, sofa agreement with lot of countries uh this was actually first signed in 2017 and there's one more agreement called uh, axa acquisition acquisition and the cross service agreement this was signed way back in 2007 which allows any us uh, ship a naval ship or even a commercial ship to do a port call or to land up in the port on a uh, you know kind of an uh, urgency or a kind of a uh, one hour scenario kind of a thing but the sofa agreement uh, axa agreement was uh, actually it's, it's it's unipolar it it benefits one what it says is i can use your base one or times when i need and you can all as well use my military base one or times now we know the size of the sri lankan navy is too small their sphere of influence of sri lankan navy is restricted to their territorial waters and they don't have to or they don't have the capacity or the ambition strategic ambition to go Uh, to a far away american base uh, say for example one in africa or one in gulf uh, to do some servicing or a maintenance or a port call but vis a vis us navy is num- the world's number one they are present across the oceans so they can frequently use this call now when this agreement was renewed that particular call of on a one hour basis has been removed which means that they can visit re- as frequently as they can we also know chinese uh, presence in amman tota the south southern part of sri lanka where they already have established a commercial port which later can be used for a military purpose as well. it's on a 19 annual lease it's a completely a chinese uh, entity now 
Now coming to the SOFA agreement, Security of Forces agreement, it gives enormous powers for Sri Lanka uh, for the U.S. Uh, you know to operate in Sri Lanka. The salient aspects of this agreement is first is uh, U.S. security personnel, uh, U.S. Uh, intelligence services, be it FBI, CIA, their subordinates, their contractors, U.S. military contractors. Has to have a priority access in terms of visa and immigration in Sri Lanka. They can be in their uniforms. Point number two, they can carry their weapons, which is point number three. And the fourth and the important point is they can they should be provided diplomatic immunity. They should they also need to have a diplomatic immunity. Diplomatic immunity is per se given to the consulate or the embassies of a country, not to any other person. Anybody who is not part of the embassy or consulate is not provided a diplomatic uh, immunity. But in this case, they are supposed to provide diplomatic immunity to the uh, U.S. soldiers or people who are getting involved, you know, landing up in Sri Lanka. And the fifth important point is they can go and have uh, researchers on culture, politics, and so on. We know what that research means. Is basically your manager show there. So which clearly gives uh, us free access to operate in sri lanka in way they want and they cannot be challenged by any of the sovereign laws of uh, sri lanka now this agreement when it was initially signed was eight pages when it was renewed the axa was when it was renewed uh, the the size of the agreement is 83 pages now all the sri lankan parties have been questioning now this was pushed during uh, uh, rajapaksa's time uh, he couldn't heed. We remember, sir, we had spoken about this in, uh, I think, a year before, where I mentioned about uh, the U.S. ambassador to Sri Lanka. She was known for uh, toppling governments. And exactly uh, quite some time after, we saw the Rajapaksa's government being thrown out by their own people. And then Ranil came in. Ranil uh, is a very shrewd diplomat, is a very learned man, is is a clear pro-U.S. man. Everybody, uh, you know, who closely watches Sri Lanka knows it. Ranil is a clearly a pro-US uh, man. Now, when this agreement was signed, so the opposition parties have been pressurizing the government to declassify this agreement and to tell what is exactly happening, how much of, uh, you know, national sovereignty has been compromised, if at all, if it is compromised. Now, both this AXA and SOFA, it's completely, it favors US. They can land and they can do anything. Now, when this was asked, government could, didn't uh, publish any, uh, declassify this. They said it is uh, all good. We are not violating any principles. We have signed it. We will we will give you. Later, they gave a uh, seven to eight page, a singly translated version of this agreement, which is very, very generic. Now, the SOFA agreement, we can Google it and see uh, US has got it with, uh, you know, as an agreement with most of the NATO nations, almost 30, 40 countries, US has it with Japan. They are literally free to operate there uh, a lot of uh, uh, these countries do oppose us security forces entering their country and uh, operating there freely now why they are doing it at this juncture is the, is the question which need to be deciphered if you analyze it closely uh, from 90s onwards till date us has been handling sri lanka uh, in a way through india 80 percent of the you know uh, the, the the us uh, uh, sri lanka relations was actually through india a lot of indian involvement was there but uh, we have seen the chinese presence uh, since 2005 in the past 15 to 17 years chinese have aggressively uh, moved in sri lanka the port city is one example hambantota port is one example the eastern terminal of uh, colombo port is one example so there is a big, big, uh, big power struggle which is happening in the Indian Ocean, and Sri Lanka has presented at a very, very strategic location. Later on, in the past seven to eight years, or I would say in the past five years precisely, India is also upping its hand in Sri Lanka. And uh, two weeks before, it has been officially announced that the Sri Lanka will start, Sri Lankans will start using the Indian currency. Now this definitely didn't go, didn't go well with the US. US don't want to lose the dollar hegemony or the dollar uh, de-dollarization as far as even the tiniest nation like Sri Lanka, they don't want to lose the hedge. So they have been uh, kind of pushing Sri Lanka to move away from it. But Sri Lanka eventually has to agree for this, uh, for the Indian uh, credit of uh, $3 billion plus and the Indian investments in Sri Lankan energy sector. 
uh, in future sri lanka is going to be dependent on energy uh, with india uh, so their uh, when a country goes bankrupt their strategic autonomy is the first thing which has been taken out from them this is what which clearly we see in uh, sri lanka so in this particular point they want to directly engage with sri lanka uh, in in a way to check counter check india as well and also this doesn't fit anywhere in the quad frame now in the broader spectrum of quad uh, australia and japan has to be here now japan has been uh, working closely together with india in, in terms of handling uh, the sri lankan investments loan and infra and so on so but us has kept this away it's a direct one on one contact between us and sri lanka at this point of time this in a way negates quad and in a way negates their strategic uh, approach of uh, you know uh, controlling china and sri lanka through india so india is also closely watching it uh, but we have also had uh, taken some uh, jain steps in terms of uh, solar and uh, uh, petroleum conventional energies in north and east uh, indian investments are uh, going up indian rupee is being used in uh, sri lanka now so uh, this is a very very complex game it's a tiny island nation but the stakes of this particular uh, country is very very high for who or wants to control and dominate the indo pacific region secondly if you see the the iran uh, the saudi deal which was brokered by uh, china that space was actually deliberately uh, given by us they declared it last year openly that we are going to uh, you know pull up our uh, military from various nations and the primary one would be from the middle east so they are no more interested in afghanistan afghanistan they you know they gave up uh, uh, you know they gave lot of arms and ammunition uh, for these guys to fight among themselves and to keep them busy and as far as middle east is concerned uh, the the impact of crude and spec and, and and the de-dollarization which is happening they are consciously aware of it now they want to put their entire focus Uh, on a proxy war in ukraine and on a long medium to long term basis in the indian ocean region to control china now djibouti is with uh, china china and then we have uh, this particular port uh, colombo which is very very uh, in in a way they have taken away one port hambantota uh, but commercially it is not a viable project it definitely it means for a military purpose now us has also increased its uh, presence five more locations in indonesia they are in talks with uh, uh, asia asean nations asean nations uh, have a you know it's like a european union they have a closed uh, this thing but they are speaking to independent nations addressing their independent concerns and uh, they are quickly moving into uh, indian ocean region so this is definitely not a great news uh, for china and to an extent it's a concern for india because in this this place all our strategic assets if you see it's in the bay of bengal uh, peninsula it's in the starting from odisha our uh, missile launching centers uh, our atomic research centers our atomic uh, nuclear power plants strategic assets all fall here any foreign country even though us is a strategic partner with us we still don't have a a uh, robust uh, you know kind of a thick brother kind of a uh, relation with us so india also has to watch out now as we speak yesterday i i, I was just going through a space research thing uh, china has uh, actually uh, silently put a satellite receiving center in sri lanka they are planning to put it they are i think they have already done it in an university so china will also react to it but as of now what we can conclude is this was a card which was pulled up by uh, us uh, all of a sudden they want to show that they are dominating and uh, this was to basically to check china uh, but in this there is a you know there is a sub loop in this is they also want to check india yes indeed in fact uh, just an hour ago we talked in dgi about the dominance that china is enjoying among the asean nations so this is i guess us is counterplay now what can india do major madan india's naval ambitions are big but india needs to do a lot of work to catch up in terms of size and the number of carriers and the distance like you need to have nuclear submarines so that you don't have to go to a port to refuel a lot of considerations like that where does india's naval program stand today 
so indian navy as of now uh, strategically they are focusing up uh, in in uh, you know in using or or i would say utilizing our major strength which most of us forget in our map is the kar nicobar island so we are coming up with a massive port uh, infrastructure in kar nicobar uh, which will also be a military base for a integrated theater command yeah, as of now we have only one integrated command where the army navy and uh, air force work together is in andaman that is very very close to the malacca strait and that is very very strategically located it is to, close to the coco islands coco islands is hardly 50 km from there it is close to malacca straits and it can kind of uh, help india dominate uh, all the way uh, you know to, to, to the south china sea and we do have two aircraft carriers uh, one on the eastern seaboard and one on the western seaboard but we need one more navy has already projected it and that's going to be a 65000 ton class uh, aircraft carrier uh, as far as the submarines the nuclear fuel submarines or ssbns are concerned uh, we are still left out this is where the indo french relation comes into play now uh, france is not part of quad france is not part of aucus france is not part of uh, the u2i2 Uh, france is not part of uh, the african uh, american alliance they have been left out completely they it's a very you know by size it may be but it's still a very powerful nation they also need uh, to have their strong presence as far as the indo pacific region is concerned so france need a trustable partner which is none other than india so france uh, as actually uh, there are in talks with i think the talks is going to get finalized we will be having a french technology uh, built uh, indigenously built with the french technology uh, nuclear submarines uh, which will take around a decade of time uh, considering the current load which we have on uh, goa shipyard and cochin shipyard but that's in uh, process uh, as for sri lanka is concerned india need to play a hard ball now because it's not only about uh, the american influence on sri lanka or the chinese influence on sri lanka the sri lankan government as uh, till date has been untrustable with the 3 billion dollar plus credit loan we have given to the sri lankan government at the time of crisis and uh, remember we are one of the main guarantor for their imo payload which they are enjoying at this case uh, sri lanka also does also has done a couple of things which i put it in my channel in tamil uh, yesterday the thing is uh, they are back to this cultural homogenization they have been demolishing historic shiva temples uh, there is one temple in north which is very very famous and uh, which has got a 1800 year old history there is a shiva temple and there is a, a krishna temple close by and there is a bhairav temple as well now this was demolished uh, way back in 2013 uh, it's a beach front it's a sea side temple uh, So it's got a well you know you can go in it's one of the one one of the ancient temple with a with a with a, with a, with a wonderful uh, architecture that was demolished silently and a presidential resort was built for the president and the family to come and stay there uh, rajapaksa did that post that there was not much of a thing so this was completely with the sri lankan coast guard it is a military zone and after 20 after 1990 Uh, they have given the access to uh, go on the, you know visit this temples now when they saw the temple the shiva temple doesn't exist the bhairav temple doesn't exist uh, 70% of the uh, the lord krishna temple has been demolished they made it into something else and the height of uh, this is where we are we have to clearly look sri lanka in a different prism as far as india's foreign policy is concerned is we have given away or gifted away our island called kachatir the island was gifted during indira gandhi's time uh, to sri lanka uh, at simultaneously later 10 years later we signed the indo sri lanka accord on uh, the sri lankan tamil rights amendment of uh, constitution 13a and so on so they have still not honored it but we have given the rights of that uh, we have actually given the island to uh, sri lanka without even uh, you know getting it in parliament so it it gave two rights to india in that agreement one is there is a church there which the tamil fishermen go on uh, you know worship there it's a festival which happens once in a year and secondly tamilian fishermen can have the rights to go on dry their fishing nets these are the two important clauses 
but as of now uh, uh, one is happening the uh, temple festival is happening with sri lankan permission but uh, the rights of you know going and putting their fishing nets there has been kind of denied but the heights of this is uh, from the church it's hardly 500 meters away they have built up a buddhist temple there now we are talking about taking the island back either by a long lease or or by the clear violation of agreement india has all the rights to get that uh, piece of island back it's just a 1.5 square kilometer uh, island but it holds a lot of lot of strategic importance as far as the indian navy is concerned it exactly is very very close to it is exactly center point between india and sri lanka if you see from rameshwaram so if a country which is bankrupt which has just kind of recovered from a civil war kind of a scenario which is still on a bailout which is still on a imf loan can do such a geopolitical uh, or a geopolitical move like this against a country of uh, size of india then definitely this is not to be seen as a one not religious incident of uh, putting a buddha statue there uh, hardly nobody leaves there why do you want to go and put a buddha temple there so this is a posture which they have adopted post the imf loan i, I think india need to now <clears throat> handle them a bit more sternly uh, if not the way we handle pakistan but a clear message has to go to sri lanka that <coughs> all these loans and uh, the bailout packages which we have given doesn't come for free and indian interest in terms of security uh, be it dead island be it kachatheev or be it uh, uh, you know the cultural demolition or homogenization north and east is concerned protection of tamil rights all this has to be protected otherwise if there is a massive demographic change in the north and east of sri lanka then the price which we are going to pay in the long term is going to be really really heavy thank you so much uh, major madan and we have been talking about this that the northern part of sri lanka and north eastern part of sri lanka are undergoing a huge demographic change and it's not just conversion it's also i think some resettling going on uh, it it the, the the people there uh, you know some people say major madan that there are more sri lankan tamils outside of sri lanka than in sri lanka this has been migration that's been going on for over 40 years um they what is the mood of the non resident sri lankans what are they thinking about any idea on what they feel towards their homeland so the uh, the uh, the problem with them is they have been settled in um, in canada they settled well in uk they settled well in us uh, they have already seen the second and third generation uh, their next generation would definitely not want to go back to their homeland with a kind of uh, infrastructure or with the kind of problems which persist there so north basically as a lot of old people they, they don't want to come out they just are settled there and uh, now the government the sri lankan government is deliberately doing lot of islamic settlements there so what happens is during the civil war uh, which kind got concluded in 2009 lot of this revenue land the independent land individuals land was taken by the military it became military bases now after the war is over there is a pact and the law which was passed that this land will be given back to the respective land owners when they were giving it back now there are certain pockets of land which has been donated exclusively to muslims now the locals out there they objected because the the earlier demography is is the the muslims live more towards south they they live close to more more towards south and part of east the north they have not seen a settlement there now that has been happening so the question natural question which comes to them is when you give back our land give us our land back why there is a new set of uh, you know uh, people who come and want to settle in here so north and east is basically it's a, it's a forest and a mineral rich area and uh, they are in a process of establishing a cement factory a lot of uh, growth is going on and one example i'll give you there is a beautiful hot water spring in north it's a natural hot water spring it's a tourist spot the local panchayat of that uh, place used to get the revenue as a, from the tourist and they used to maintain the place and they made a li- livelihood now suddenly this hot water spring has been taken under the archaeological survey department of sri lanka now that the revenue now goes to the the, the 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 sri lankan government there it's it's a local revenue it's a panchayat it's a local revenue which which ideally should be going to the local people 
now all these things are uh, agitating the local people there the uh, tamil diaspora outside sri lanka they have been actively lobbying with the indian government they have been actively engaging with the, you know the british government uh, the nordic governments and us but unfortunately all of them have a various thought like the set of uh, sri lankan tamil diaspora are totally they they hate india simply they hate india for because of the incidents which happened in the past there are certain uh, people who believe that india is the only country which can give solution to this problem so let's engage with the government now there are third set of people who are got, who actually got caught in the tamil nadu politics they they kind of see the north south you know the aryan dravidian divide they got lost into it so and the local uh, the parties the tamil national palayan so called the tamil parties there there are three either one is a pro left one is a pro singalese uh, one so let's kind of coexist negotiate and uh, get what we want the third one's what wants an autonomy and there is still certain set of people who want an independent country now there is no single leadership to unite all of them they are very very powerful but the problem is they are divided so these problems they keenly watch it i i amaze uh, i really get amazed by the kind of geopolitical knowledge these people have because if you ask anybody in tamil nadu a common uh, man in tamil nadu he will not be having this much of a geopolitical knowledge they closely watch it but unfortunately their numerical threshold is too less now and uh, their uh, even there is a debate between north and east and malayalam tamil who, who went from uh, tamil nadu settled there they don't consider them to be part of their group so it's a very split and a, uh, you know divided group so they are not able to achieve their political objectives because of that yes a lot of questions there to ponder and how india navigates all this uh, it remains to be seen and uh, major madan thank you so much for bringing us up to date on what is happening in this tear drop nation let's hope that peace prevails but whatever you are saying and whatever we are seeing there was an attempt on part of the bjp government by sending anamalai in an informal visit where he went and visited all these different groups i think he has done it two times now what is the effect on the ground on that if any and where does that tie into this whole thing after that we'll take some questions with your permission definitely sir after uh, the anamalai's visit to sri lanka he has gone there twice uh, the minister of state uh, mr l murugan he went once and a couple of other leaders tamil nadu bjp leaders who went and uh, visited engaged with a lot of these people so uh, in in a, during a meeting so uh, he just mentioned to me that you know the kind of mess which uh, you know the various political parties in tamil nadu and congress has made in the past it's really really difficult for us to go and you know convince them to win their trust again so that's one problem but there are a lot of uh, positive things which are coming up the one good example is uh, during the pongal uh, festival ranil vikram singh openly said uh, he committed to tamil people that we will amend the constitution 13 13a so if that happens it gives a kind of a semi autonomy uh, to the tamil population there they can choose their own chief minister have their own revenue they can manage their uh, thing and india can also give a pointed uh, focused aid come infrastructure come you know trade uh, relation to that particular part so that's happening and one other good news is to collect connect this uh, ethnic races uh, uh, you know culturally and in terms of trade uh, we have launched we are going to launch next year it is going to be live there is a ship uh, a passenger ship which will move, go from karakal pondicherry to sri lanka at a 50 dollar per head cost so that opens up a lot of avenue you can it's just a visa on arrival you can just get it stamped and you can visit those places uh, in terms of tourism in terms of trade so and so we are trying to rebuild that bridge and the connect which we have uh, but one thing which i can definitely tell our viewers is that there are two cards which is up for the play and that will be close to the 24 elections so it it is going to be a massive surprise uh, for people out here people who made a living out of uh, you know this politics a lot of people made a living out of this uh, you know the the civil war and the and the killings which happened in sri lanka are going to have a great amount of shock because there are two cards which still 
we got to play and it will be played in next 6 to 7 months we will disclose it sir i'm sorry i had muted myself we will disclose that a little bit later and now let's take a few questions major madan yeah yeah sir yes we can go ahead uh arindam ghatak wants to know why are you asking me man our guest is major madan sir i haven't seen much coverage of bhutan statement about india and china having equal states in the doklam matter i would think this is a big blow for india how come no coverage we covered it in daily global insights uh, mm -hmm. arindam please do watch it three times a week around 7 pm ist is when it airs thank you next question please prithik great wants to know ask major madan why cia fails to do regime change operations in china Uh, see, uh, it is it is not that easy for uh, it's not a Soviet. You know, you call Mr. Mikhail Gorbachev, give him a Nobel Peace, give him an award, and then you try to break the country. It doesn't happen that way. Russia was close to Europe, so I mean, Soviet then Soviet was close to Europe, so it was possible. China's internal security budget is more than their defense budget. effectively there are two cameras on each chinese citizen which monitors them two cameras per citizen the concentration of uh, cctvs uh, per capita is the highest in china it's a so stone walled intelligence police state it will take lot of efforts to do that it doesn't mean that china doesn't have a fault line but what china has smartly done is they know what is their fault line they know xinjiang is a problem they know manchurian you know province is a issue they know uh, tibet is an issue they have kind of invested over a period of 20 years to kind of lock this they have their own social media they're not dependent on twitter they're not dependent on facebook they're not dependent on instagram they have their own internal systems so they can kind of you know stone wall this entire uh, thing and they have a very very highly state controlled uh, media so nothing uh, goes off uh, but the major fault line which which is going to eventually hit china is like when you have such an arrangement you need to keep your citizens really busy uh, which means everybody has to be employed and they cannot be jobless uh, the job uh, unemployment is about 10% in china now if it rises then this will not work it's going to create a lot of chaos which we already saw during the covid people came on street and protested uh, it is not vulnerable us ca is definitely at it there are a lot of uh, projects which are uh, going on but you also should understand china is equally doing that to us and in fact they are not ahead than us um prithik uh, just to add to what uh, major madan said um you should watch elmer uns hang out on my channel Elmer talks about how an entire section of CIA got wiped out because they had an informer that leaked all the data and the one set of CIA agents inside China were completely eliminated by China very very unfortunate and that means that you have to rebuild your assets again and that is where that is happening also remember two things that you may or may not know um Elmer is doing every day there's a broadcast and he doesn't broadcast in the main mandarin he broadcasts in cantonese cantonese is a language spoken primarily in hong kong and closer regions and it is believed that 100 million people in mainland china also understand cantonese you have 7 million or so in hong kong plus the 100 million and for it's for them that this news is going plus there is something called as a falun gong sect which are mostly buddhist many of them are vegetarian in fact their body parts are also much sought after because their body parts are considered clean and uh, they also suffer the same kind of things that the uyghurs suffer they constitute about 100 million but very underground this is very suppressed people don't even know that epoch times is the name of the newspaper and channel that they have in the us that talks about all these things so you can watch that so there is some things there are some things going on but it takes time it's a closed uh, country and and it, it depends i think most likely the west will ruin china economically and for that india needs to really step in as an viable economic alternative once that happens and it's already happening maybe not at the pace that you and i want that is the difference it in you know, india is 1.4 billion and it creates an australia every day by way of population 
So it's not easy. So that's what I just wanted to add to what you said, Vijay Madan. Next, go to the next question. Magnet Ranga wants to know, any foreign force so close to India is totally avoidable. But if it should happen, would India be better off with US in Sri Lanka than China? Yeah, obviously, we'll be better off with US in Sri Lanka than China. But here, uh, whether to share that intelligence or how much of intelligence is shared, or whether if the right intelligence is shared, that all depends upon the US. It's not on the Indian side. So it's not a great uh, thing to have such a big global power uh, hardly 30 kilometers from your country. Arindam Ghatak again. Sir, China is building a military base in the Cocoa Islands offshore of Burma. What's up with that? That is to counter India's uh, ambitions and strategic plans uh, in the Kar Nicobar Island. The island which you are mentioning right now, uh, there, there is a satellite imagery, even I too saw that there is a 2300 meter uh, runway which has come up. It is because of the Junta's military government in Myanmar. Uh, this will kind of, this was, this was a game which was going on for a long time. As in when a democratic government was there in Myanmar, this used to get stalled. Because we have a very good relation with uh, Myanmar. But whenever the military government comes in, uh, that's where China tends to play all this. Uh, eventually, it'll, it is going to uh, be a Chinese base. We don't have any doubts about it. But uh, we have a formidable uh, base uh, coming up in uh, Nicobar. Investments of almost 50,000 crore plus is going to get pumped in. So that will uh, check the dynamics. So this power game is on. We, 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 we cannot match China. Let's be very plain and simple, Frank. We cannot match China in every single location. But Andamans is going to be a very important strategic location for us. Now, other thing you need to understand is even they have a military base in Cocoa Island, their rear, which is the main base, is quite far away from Cocoa Island. Look at Andamans and Kolkata is very, very close. Andaman and Odisha is very, very close. The third closest distance is Chennai, right? But it, it is not in case of China. It's not about having a military base uh, in a particular island. For that, you need to have a, such a large, large fleet of aircraft carriers like which US has. Just having a military base alone doesn't give you uh, a strategic advantage. Definitely, it gives you a muzzle. It gives you it increases your sphere of influence. But doesn't mean that... See, just simple, simply imagine... If a fighter jet takes off from that air base and, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it kind of comes close to India and try to attack India, uh, how will the replenishment in that island have? It has to come all the way from China. Or they need to have one more military base in Myanmar, which India will not allow. Because India is also close to share a good amount of border with Myanmar. We do have, you know, a lot of issues which are coming up. If Myanmar uh, goes the Pakistan way, which they are not, if Myanmar, for any reasons, goes the Pakistan way, India can quickly get them in the FATF grey list because the second highest OPM is produced in uh, Myanmar. Well, uh, one thing, one observation before we go to the next question. Viewers, every country that the British took Indians to run the country for them, whenever that country expelled the Indians, that country faced economic ruin. One of them was Uganda. The other one is Myanmar. Myanmar forced out hundreds, if not thousands. Yeah. They were forced to walk back from there. And I don't know what Mr. Nehru was smoking. He was a big smoker, by the way. You might not see that from his pictures, uh, but he was a big smoker. I don't know what he was smoking. He should have stopped Myanmar uh, from exporting all the Hindus and in, uh, primarily from Tamil Nadu. Chettiars mostly because they were all businessmen. See, yeah, there yeah. was a ring. You know, you, the ring came from, you know, Chennai. They went all the way along the East Coast and to Myanmar, and then from there to Penang, Malaysia, for Singapore. It, it was a huge, uh, you know, influence, wave of influence, sphere of influence. I'll tell you why it is very, it was huge. Today, there's a bank that was doing all these things, Indian Overseas Bank, that was used, that was different yeah, actually. primarily to, <laughs> to take care of these kind of interests. So it, it, those countries lost when they did this thing. Unfortunately, now we are stuck with a situation where India has to go back and rebuild some of these bridges. Hopefully that happens very soon. That's my hope. Let's go to the next question. Arindam Ghatak wants to know, sir, I'm sorry, Kunal Agarwal. Guys, don't ask me questions, guys. Ask our guests. When are we going to acquire Pakistan and China land just like how they are trying to? Why are we always defending? Why can't we be on offense and let them defend? Go ahead. See, offense, you know offense, <laughs> offense comes with a lot of cost. Offense comes with a lot of cost. 
human lives and economy today are we in a situation to do it maybe we can reclaim some amount of land in pok but the cost which we are going to pay economically is it will put us back 10 years it will reverse our economic cycle by at least by 10 years and uh, akshay chin it's a far fledged area it's a remote inhabitable terrain it's a desert yes we need to reclaim it no doubts about it but this has to be uh, not essentially a military action it cannot need not be essentially a kinetic action it can be in many other ways Shri, uh, see ex- just for example look at how ambandota port was taken uh, by china was it a military action look at a port which was taken from kenya by uh, china was it a military action we don't have to you know be that uh, military focused way of uh, approaching things but today uh, for the next 10 years our uh, only focus or strategy is to close the gap uh, in terms of economy in terms of trade and in terms of military we need to modernize our military we need to up our ante we need to close in as close as to china uh, because that's the biggest threat for us and we need to understand our threat first then we can go on our offensive so once we do that there will be a time where china will get into eventually will get into a war with taiwan and uh, countries like japan that's the time you need to hit them or you can always get on a negotiation table and get it done that's how we in fact we solved our uh, border issues with uh, bangladesh it's hardly through negotiations this is not a right time we just recovered from covid we just our economy has just recovered from covid and the global scenarios economical scenarios also not looking so great the banking collapse is happening so this is not a right time for us to start a war uh, to achieve our ultimate objectives we still have a lot of time and we will do it eventually and, and kunal to add to what uh, major uh, madan said you know the 1971 war of bangladesh only 13 days of war yeah. but it cost india economically so much it took 21 years 1992 when narasimha rao came and opened up the country it took that long before india could again start rebuilding itself so these kinds of things are very expensive economically if if uh, see russia is right now on their knees in terms of what they can do and they cannot do remember that now us is supplying almost all of west european oil and gas mm-hmm. needs so what's going to happen to russia's oil it's also going to try to sell to other countries india is in a very good position right now because it can get russian oil probably at cost meaning like there is no gain profit margin for uh, for russia but the, this is the, the the geopolitics has never been so interesting i guess in my lifetime it's become so interesting these days so just stay tuned listen to a good major he has some very very new perspectives that i haven't heard anywhere else and that's your reason why you should be coming and encouraging people to join p gurus as subscribers next question please partha wants to know uh, what is your favorite indian overseas operation peace i would always say cactus operation cactus you can google it it's a very interesting operation <laughs> next question please harry iitm sivan sutt kulanasam rajapaksha is facing it uh, explain I would, that uh, i would 100% say i would 100% say uh i believe i believe in this i strongly believe in this he is paying for it imagine a 1800 old hinchin temple being you know destroyed to rubbles and then you built a presidential resort for your own family the entire family is facing it today. the country is facing it so there is no jokes about it the country is facing it uh, we have a this thing that you know uh, i still remember asking my parents uh, can i get you know a prashad from Sh- shiva's temple is it allowed or should i, should I just uh, have it here and come back because that's the level of sensitivity is in all they are paying for it obviously if we if at all we believe in our uh, ethos they are paying for it chetan mandiyam chakravarti uh, madan ji if india america is itching for a war with us on george soros's behest you know see these are all like this is not america will never want to have a war with india that's the last thing they would want to do but uh, the the superpower always want to be the superpower they want to control the governments they want to control the government of the day so regime change is one thing which uh, us is quite uh, known for so they will try these are all the soft cards which they will use just soros is not uh, end of uh, anything 
we we are 130 you know crore population everybody is aware today we have channels like p gurus channels so many channels which enlighten and educate people so people are quite very much aware you know i i would say this one man show is no more that's not going to exist anymore we are in a living going to live in a multipolar Aizam Ghatak wants to know, can India capture Sri Lanka and make it India's 29th state? Quite, quite a heavy price we have to pay. Do you want to spend that much of money in making a 29th state? The answer is no. See, unless or until uh, the people agree, you know, we connect back culturally. There is a cultural connect which used to exist uh, almost till the 18th century, 1850. Until, unless we do that, the people understand that we are from the same genetics, we are one. So this is just by force acquiring something. You will create something else and you will be dealing with it, which is not the right. We will uh, be, you know, increasing our, we should increase our influence in Sri Lanka. But uh, annexing the country in today's uh, world, it's not just not possible. Yeah, not, no need for that. You know, no need for that. Then, yeah, you're, I think India is doing the right thing in my opinion. Guys, Adding more ground is not really worth it anymore. It's what you can do with what you have. How well you can do that. That's what makes a huge difference. Next question. Magnet Ranga wants to know, how would TN react to such important issues? Would they support the central government? See, the domestic politics is superior for them. If they support the central government, ideally they should be. Uh, there is an attempt uh, in the hindsight to develop a consensus as far as this is concerned. But most of the parties in Tamil Nadu, be it DMK, be it ADMK, uh, they just want to move on from the Sri Lankan issue. It is no more, uh, none of these parties want to be an electoral issue in Tamil Nadu because everybody has messed up. Everybody has messed up. So they don't want this to be an electoral issue. Even uh, somebody like Seeman, uh, who is ideal, the party's ideology is about Tamil Desiyam. The, uh, Kachi, the NTK, they have also slowly moved out from this, uh, you know, Elam Tamil's rights issue. They don't, uh, they don't, uh, you know, they are not vocal about it. They speak more about local issues because that's the kind of a uh, trap which they always think. Even when we said, you know, when somebody came out who was very, very, very close to Prabhagar came out and said he is alive, all these guys were in a huddle to say, no, he is not alive. Ideally, they should be happy saying that he is alive. So they don't want to get into this. And uh, when some good thing happens in Sri Lanka, as far as Tamil rights are concerned, their autonomy, state autonomy and stuff, definitely BJP will uh, take the credit, which eventually these guys will try to oppose it and make it more uh, a political this thing. They are not going to have a come into a single page concern. The story is that many of the DMK, ADMK politicians own large uh, resorts in Sri Lanka. Don't go by what they say publicly and what they own. It's in their interest that Sri Lanka is stable and that you go visit Sri Lanka as a tourist, okay? These guys are the biggest hypocrites I've ever seen. <laughs> Gaurav from Gaurav SF, uh, a Prana Pratishta idol is broken. What are the consequences spiritually? Um, Gaurav, uh, Major Madan is a big Shiv Bhakt. Let me ask him this question and I'll add a two cents after that. Please go ahead, Major Madan. See, if you break it by mistake, this is not an issue. If you break it by without intention of not, you know, intention of breaking it, that's a different story. If you break it without intention by mistake or by accident, you can just leave it in your uh, nearest uh, temple or you can immerse it in a water body, preferably a moving water body, a river or if not, at least a lake. Uh, if it is done with intention, then I'm sure you need to do some uh, pariyarams for it. As far as the, you know, the simple knowledge, very humble knowledge I have about it. Yeah. So, Gaurav, what happens with all these temples is there is, uh, you know, periodically you'll have what is called as Kumbha Abhishekam. What Kumbha Abhishekam means is that there would have been some work that would have been done either around the Murti or sometimes on the Murti itself to try and fix something. So, whenever you do something like that, then there is a process for that. That's why we always differentiate between temples that follow Agamas versus temples that don't follow Agamas and, and there are slightly different twins but it is possible for you to relocate the Murti from where it resides, take it to some other place and then you fix the place that is damaged and then go back and do a Prana Pratishta. So all these things, everything is codified. Every step of the way, is, everything is known 
what needs to be done, how it needs to be done. So when people say that we have to move a temple for the reason of laying a road or something like that, there are ways to deal with this. There are ways to deal with this. I mean, you know, there are how many temples of Shiva that are called Dakshinamurti temples, meaning south facing. There's a reason for that. There are 16 Shiva temples built over hundreds of years. They're all on 79.4 degrees longitude. Why? How did they know that there has to be only on this line? It starts from Kedarnath, comes all the way down to Rameshwaram. You can, you, 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 you might have seen this thing in social media also. There's a lot of significance. You will never find a temple uh, without an older temple, that is, without a stream running by it. They had to have a stream running by every temple. You, you have you been to the Peru temple in uh, uh, Peru temple in Coimbatore, uh, Major Madan? Yes, sir, sir. I've been there once. You, there is a stream there. There's a stream yeah, there's there. a stream there's there. Water. There is always there's a stream. Not much water, but there is water there. You know, yeah. they, 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 it has always been the case. Any temple, you will have a stream running by close by because most of the time the Abhishekam people had to, you know, bathe in the stream, and and with wet clothes they have to come and pray at uh, the at the murti, and then they go about their business. People used to make this a habit, daily habit. Get in the morning. Go take shower, take bath in the running stream, then do puja, and then you go about doing your work. So there are lots of things that we need to go back and relearn. At the same time, these things, if you are done willfully, I fully agree with Major Madan that has very disastrous consequences for the person who's doing it. Chetan Mandiam Chakravarti wants to know: Can't we sabotage American sabotage activities regarding Sri Lanka? <laughs> See, it is not that they are doing against India. Let's let's understand the context first. They want to engage with Sri Lanka directly. Their ultimate objective is to counter China. Whether they do through you or whether, you know, we have it between the friends, right? Somebody you introduce and then he speaks to you, you know, your friend directly. That's a kind of a thing. It is not to check India. Uh, but it, oh, quote unquote, it has a concern for India. There, there is a strong concern for India, which, which has been, we have denied this access uh, for quite some time. We have denied this access way back, I think, in 1980s, when they wanted to have a satellite, uh, you know, radar receiving system in Trigonamalai. Trigonamalai is a place where they want to keep it, which can literally look, look over India. But today we are in a place where we can, you know, kind of counter this. Their objective is to counter China. But again, I say there is a concern. If India doesn't uh, uh, listen to American way, you know, of thinking, or they don't listen, so there is a kind of things which they can, uh, you know, tweak in here. But their uh, their objective remains China. It's not India. Also, Trikona Malay means Trikon. It's, it's actually a Sanskrit word. Trikona Trikona Malay actually. It's actually Trikona Malay. Uh, it, it is not a triangle. It's not a triangle. It's triangle. Trikona. Yeah. It's a triangle. Yeah. On yeah. a Karthik Vishwanathan wants to know, was not Kachatibu going to Sri Lanka also to be blamed on Karunanidhi? Well, he was the chief minister at that time. See, I would first blame the prime minister. <laughs> because the state government cannot straight away sign something, some territory and give it to somebody else. But yes, uh, the, uh, the party which was known to fight for the state rights, they didn't fight. They kept quiet. Harry IITM, British manipulated history of Hindus and eliminating Buddhism from India is root cause of Sri Lankan hate for Hindu Tamils. Your opinion, same with Bhutan. Yeah, partially it is right. Partially it is right. The narrative was said that, you know, the Buddhism was uh, killed by the Hindu kings and so and so. That was a narration. Uh, Sri, uh, more than Bhutan, Bhutan, I have a couple of friends, uh, Bhutanese have a different way of thinking. Uh, they want to preserve the original form of Buddhism, which they believe. But Sri Lanka, yes, they do have, uh, this is inculcated right from your childhood. Singhalese has been inculcated right from the childhood. So you will see the strong, very strong polarized religious view uh, as far as the Lankan Buddhist monks are concerned, because the Buddha Pikshas play a very important role in politics as well. Any politicians who go on an election campaign, has to have their blessings. So that is you know, what you said, said is right. They still understand uh, the history in a wrong way. Uh, the, the one which was narrated by British that the Buddhism was, uh, you know, was killed by uh, the Hindu kings, which is not the case. 
uh, viewers, before we leave, uh, leave in the comments, which is the biggest Brahma temple in the whole world? The answer will surprise you. Thank you so much, Major Madan. And viewers, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also, follow Major Madan if you happen to be understanding Tamar. He has an excellent Tamar channel. Much of the stuff that we come is by me watching his channel. Oh, this looks good. This will benefit the entire uh, uh, viewership of P Gurus. That's why I invite him into this one. So, a lot of stuff happens, breaking news. Major Madan, you are carving a new path in, in Tamar journalism also because that is so DMK fied. It's very, very sad, but at least it gives us reason for existence and growth, right? So thank you so much once again, sir, to ta for taking time off from your busy schedule. You've been having some health issues also. You are all looking great right now. Thank you so much. May God bless you with great health. And we'll be back again very soon with Major Madan. Namaskar. Thank you, sir. Namaskaram, Jain.